Brooklyn Maboyan, thank you very much for attending. Welcome to our home. The um, first part of our series, again, the lecture today on my thought will be on the uh, Jewish slave. <laughs> no, it's not a lecture about uh, marriage. <laughs> Anyways, well, last week we finished a portion of Yisro, and in it we read the story of the Jewish nation receiving the Torah on Mount Sinai. This week, in the portion of Mishpatim, the Torah begins to discuss laws that fall under the catting of Mishpatim, civil laws. In Judaism, basically there are three categories of laws. They are Mishpatim, civil laws, Edus, testimonies, and Chukim, statutes. So Mishpatim, civil laws, are for the most part self-explanatory. Edus, testimonies, are common in all societies such as special occasions, birthdays, military victories, coronations, etc. And chukim, statutes, something which is unique to Judaism. Really, laws that defy any logic. We follow them just because they are ratzon Hashem. They are the will of God. I find it strange that the Torah would begin its discussion of laws with mishpatim, civil laws. After all, they are all based on some sort of logic. All societies need civil laws to survive. Even more unusual is the fact that the first civil law that the Torah mentions in this portion is the law concerning an Ebed Ivri, a Jewish slave. One of the most basic principles of Judaism is, Derech Eretz Kodmel the Torah, that proper etiquette precedes Torah study. The first law that the Torah records connected to civil laws teaches us the importance of what we call Kavad Abriot, showing proper respect for people. This slave is referred to by the Torah as an Evid Ivri, a Jewish slave. Even a slave, a Jew who has been sold into slavery for stealing, must be afforded the honor due to each and every Jewish individual. His master must always remember that though he is a slave, he remains a Jew with all the obligations that are connected to this fact. The Jewish slave must always remember that he has been sold, and that is why he is called an Evid, a slave. But in the end, the Torah wants his master to know and always remember that at the same time he is still an Ivri, a Jew. The Rambam is very clear on the responsibilities that the master has towards his Jewish slave. The Rambam states, the Jewish slave should be like a hired worker or a resident amongst you. In addition, he states that a master is obligated to treat any Jewish slave or maidservant as his equal. Now that is true in regards to food, drink, clothing, and living quarters. As the sages tell us, whoever purchases a Hebrew slave, in reality, purchases a master for himself. He goes even further. Tosfus in the Tractate of Kedushan states that the master is required to give his Jewish slave preferential treatment. For example, if he has only one pillow, he cannot take that pillow for himself, nor can he put it away in a closet. It must be given to his Jewish slave. We see the Torah always deals with reality. One would have thought that the last law that the nation that had just been freed from years of oppressive slavery would have to be taught would be about treating a slave with dignity and respect. The Torah is telling us a true reality of life. That many times the oppressed will become the oppressor once the opportunity arises. You know, I've read this portion many times and each time I've wondered, why would anyone buy a Jewish slave? Now, the Orachayim HaKadosh states that when you purchase a slave, it is better that you buy a Jewish slave rather than a Gentile slave, even though you will own the Gentile slave forever. But why? Who is a Jewish slave? So one can become a Jewish slave in two ways. One way is if a person is totally destitute. He doesn't even have enough food for two meals. The other way is if he stole something and he doesn't have enough money to make financial restitution to the owner. The law is that if someone steals an object, he must pay back to his victim, Kefal, twice the worth of the item that he stole. If he cannot make financial restitution, then he is sold as a slave for six years. That money is then given to his victim as compensation for the item that the thief stole and the fine prescribed by Torah law. 
So why are these two? Well, so who are these two individuals? The Abedivri. Many times they are really one and the same person, since there are cases where the thief stole only because he was hungry. On the other hand, again, because it's, po it's possible that his family had nothing to eat and he had no money. Other times, though, a thief may be someone who lived far above his financial means. And the way that he supplemented his income huh, was through thievery. So the question that we have to answer is, why would someone buy a thief or someone who is just down on his luck? If the person is buying the Jewish slave is doing so because of an act of kindness, then why buy him? Let the poor man keep his dignity and just give him a job. If the indigent person suffered from medical or mental issues, then he would become a ward of the town that he lived in. You know, we as Jews have always had charity organizations in our towns and cities to care for the needs of those that are less fortunate. This fact was proven true after the Holocaust. <clears throat> those Jews that immigrated to the United States were offered by the U.S. government minority status. They refused. They said that we Jews take care of our own. So the question remains, why would a person buy a Jewish slave? We have established that the person in question is mentally sound, since only a person of sound mind can be prosecuted for a crime. If he is infirmed or badly handicapped, then he would most likely be a ward of the community, which leads me to believe that the individual in question is someone who may, have, who may suffer from maladies, such as depression, low esteem, laziness, a lack of drive or discipline. Any one of these traits by themselves can drive a person into a variety of challenges, such as alcoholism, drug addiction, among others. So why would the master buy a slave without affording himself at least the possibility of a potential gain? Yes, the, the slave has lost his confidence, maybe even his connection to God and even to his own life. He has hit rock bottom. The master buying him as a slave gives him an opportunity, a chance, to once again get himself back on the right track. The slave may well have been, success, been a successful individual before he lost control of his life. If the master can help him to overcome the obstacles that are blocking his path, then it can easily be a win-win situation for both the master and the Jewish slave. He was, if he was sold as a thief, because not because of hunger, but because of greed, well, he drove himself into debt by living a richer lifestyle than he could afford. In the secular world, the truth is he would be sent to prison, an institution of higher learning for criminals, a place where a petty thief can learn to become a bigger and better thief. The commentaries explain the rationale for this mitzvah. It is hoped that by living in the master's home and seeing his positive example, that this servant will rehabilitate his character, learning new positive traits that will prevent him from returning to his previous lifestyle. This is similar to the scenario of the unintentional murderer who is exiled to the Orimiklot, the city of refuge. The hope being that he can benefit by living amongst the righteous priests and Levites. As an aside, the Torah is very real in its approach to life. <clears throat> Excuse me. Even if someone were to buy a Jewish slave, why would they buy a Jewish slave that had a wife and children? The Torah would require him to support the family with food, shelter, health care, clothing, etc. True, he could, the master could take any money that they earned, but it still would be an, an expense for him. The incentive the Torah gives to the master who buys this Jewish slave with a family is that the master can give the Jewish slave a non-Jewish maidservant to produce offspring that would remain the property of the master. This exception in the Jewish law is only if the Jewish slave has a wife and children, if he is single or if he is divorced or married without children, then the master may not give him a maidservant for a wife. Again, the Torah is very logical. After a man who was sold as a slave finishes his term of servitude, he does have an option to tell his master that he does not want to leave. If he chooses to do so, the master is forced to take the slave to the courthouse himself. 
he cannot designate someone else to be his messenger, his shlia. At the courthouse, the master must take an awl, and there he bores a hole in the right ear of his slave. With that act, the person has submitted himself to be the master's slave until the jubilee year, when all Jewish slaves must be set free. The concern the Torah addresses is connected to the scenario where the master unlawfully gave his Jewish slave who was single, divorced, or childless, a maidservant. During his six-year sentence, she served as his wife and born children. Uncertain about having to face his life alone again, he may well opt to stay with his slave family rather than go out into the world to fend on his own. Aware if he already had a wife and children before he entered into his term of servitude, then his family will pressure him to leave so that they can once again live a normal life. So how does the Torah deal with addiction that has crippled a person and brought them to a place of poverty and crime? The Torah has a novel approach. Sell him as a slave for six years. The Talmud tells us if you enter a perfume shop and you buy nothing, you still come out smelling better. The same can be said for the thief who was sold to a righteous Jew. The master sees an opportunity to save a soul and at the same time benefit himself. The only reason why the Jewish slave is wallowing in poverty, addiction, or in heavy debt is because he lacks the confidence and discipline necessary to attain true and lasting success. <coughs> Just like with the 12-step program of AA, Alcoholics Anonymous, he needs to give himself over to a higher power, God Almighty, and he needs a sponsor, the Jewish master. When a person sells himself into slavery, he is in essence admitting that he has lost the ability to get it together by himself. He needs help. The first part in solving a problem is to first admit that you have a problem. By relinquishing all control of his life to both God and his master, the Hebrew slave now has a path to overcome his negativity and addictions. His obligations to God, such as praying three times a day, help to establish a daily routine that he must follow. His master will assign work for him to perform. Absenteeism and tardiness are not acceptable behavior. He now has a master who will demand his attendance and productivity. His active participation is not voluntary. He is a slave and he is a Jew and he must fulfill his obligations to both. It is essential for his growth that he learns discipline. For six years, someone else will have dominion over his life those six years will hopefully help him to achieve not only discipline, but also self-confidence. For six years, he will be forced to stay the course. Sure, there may have been setbacks, but that too is part of life, learning to minimize losses and to maximize successes. The Zohar states that the cell and servitude of the Jewish slave symbolizes the descent of the soul into this physical world and into a physical body. The non-Jewish slave alludes to the initial stages of man's divine service. It is a time when he must overcome the influences of his animal soul that lust for worldly pleasures. This fact is accomplished through fear of the master and a complete acceptance and obedience of his yoke. The person is compelled to coerce his animal soul to conform to the wishes of the master. So at least in a practical sense, the Jewish slave has reached a higher level. In him resides the divine attributes of the godly soul. These attributes illuminate the soul and influence it to feel some desire for godliness. Nevertheless, the worldly desires of the animal soul have not yet been completely quieted or subdued. The highest level of divine service is symbolized by the Amma Ivriyah, the Hebrew maidservant. The law states that a young Jewish girl may only be sold by her father. The father may only do so if he is in total and abject poverty. When he sells her, it can only be with the stipulation that the purchaser has intentions of marrying her or giving her to a son for a bride. So the objective is not servitude, but rather marriage, unity with the spouse. Similarly, when the soul is sent on his journey into this world to occupy a body, 
The ultimate goal is total unity, marriage with God. Thus, the Hebrew maidservant represents the person whose desire for worldly pleasures has been completely sublimated and transformed into a desire for only godliness. I find it apropos that the Torah portion of Mishpatim, civil laws, begins with the laws concerning a Jewish slave. If we are commanded to extend so much concern about the dignity and the respect of a slave, especially one who was sold for thievery, how much more so should we all be concerned about the honor and dignity of our fellow human beings? It is true that circumstances around us have changed, we, but we as Jewish communities, as families, have not. We are still the same. Though we are still going through a difficult time, we all need to remember the first line that we recite in our morning prayers after we put on our talit and tefillin. We say, Harini Makabalalai Mitzvah Shel Kamocha, that I accept upon myself the positive command to love my neighbor as myself. Even before this pandemic began, we lived in communities of diverse personalities. We as Jews are by no means unassuming individuals. There are many of us who are strong minded people with definitive views on many topics. You might, you might say that. Really, that is our heritage. After all, the Torah refers to us many times as an Am Kishe Orev, a stiff-necked people. However, many, however, when it comes to our synagogues in the past, we were all able to park our eagles at the door and show our respect for our rabbis and for God's house. It's time for us to make a concerted effort to return to those days again when a feeling of love and harmony, and harmony permeated every inch of our houses of worship our homes. Let us look into our hearts and reconnect to the love and friendship that we all have shared in the past. You know, the name of the portion begins with the words, Eila Hamishpatim. These are the laws. The word Hamishpatim is an acronym for Hadayim Mitzuva Shiasa Pshura Termiasa Mishpat. A judge is commanded to try and make a compromise before he makes a judgment. Somewhere along the line, we may have, we, many of us have lost the ability to compromise. So let us follow the advice of the acronym connected to the name of our portion and relearn the art of compromise once again. And in that merit, may we herald in the coming of Mashiach Sakeno quickly and in our time. Again, thank you very much for listening. Again, we have work to do. God should bless you again with safety and health, success, uh, Shabbat Shalom and uh, stay warm. <laughs> Thank you again for listening.